Thank you, folks. Um, I'm quite awestruck coming on after those two brilliant students. Uh, thank you so much for that. That was such a, 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 a gorgeous resume and a gorgeous um, uh, little synopsis of, of, of my book. And thank you so much. Um, it's a real privilege to be here. It's a real pleasure as well to be, uh, to be here as the Heimboldt Chair uh, and to be here with my family in Villanova and to meet so many brilliant academic colleagues and so many wonderful students as well. Uh, we have been here since the 6th of January and um, we was, myself and Maeve were saying the other day, I don't think they're going to get rid of us. I think we're, well, I think, I think, I think we're here to stay. And, and just to make us feel all that bit more at home, you, you laid on this weather for us th today, which is, we, we, we were saying today, this is, this is the most Galway day. We, both, we live in Galway, and this is saying, this is the most, Jim, you know this, this is the most Galway, Galway weather that we've had since we came here and that. Just the, the gray and the, 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 the sky down on the ground and the continuous rain. We, felt, we feel very much at home here. Um, thank you, to, uh, thank you to, uh, to, uh, for laying on this evening. And, and thanks as well to, to the, the, the Heimboldt family for the, the, the generosity of spirit and the imaginative reach that it takes to establish and to commit to a chair like this uh, and to a, an ongoing proposal like this. And it's a credit to everyone involved. It's a credit to the university and the family and the people who administer this, this post that it has, that, that it has uh, sustained itself that it has grown in prestige, and that it has it has become it has become a, 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 such a noteworthy um, such a noteworthy feature in a writer's life to to come here and to be to be uh, to be given this opportunity to not just to write, which is a huge uh, personally for me it was a huge thing to be able to come here to write, but also to teach. Um, it's, it, it, it's been my pleasure to have, uh, to have two classes uh, of students, creative writing students and uh, literature students. And I see some of them here tonight. And um, they have been s such an unexpected pleasure, um, uh, such, a, such a boost to my time here. And uh, I want to thank them. I see them here. And I know that they're bursting to go and watch the hockey match. But yeah. it's, great, it's, great, it's, great, it's great to have them here. Thank you all. Solar Bones. Um, I, I never thought, when I, when I was sitting down, I sat down, it, it, the book came out in 2016, and I sat down in, in it must have been about 2010, when I sat, sat down to write that book. Because uh, I spent, towards the end of the book, I had to calculate how long it was that I spent writing it. And I found out that, to my amazement, I had spent over five and a half years writing it. Uh, I couldn't believe that, and um, I, was, I, I, was, I was just so baffled by it, because one of the things that, that came to light when I, when I, when I look back over the, the, the writing of the book is, I have no memory at all of writing it, uh, none whatsoever. I mean that literally. I have, uh, I, f I have five books, and I can tell you everything about the writing of the other four, but nothing about this one. Now, there's a, there's a couple of reasons for it. One, one, one reason in particular is that on the mo I sent the book to my agent at half two in the morning, and I, myself and Maeve, got into the car at half eight in the morning, and we went and we became parents that very same morning. So, so our, our, our little boy rose up between me and the book, and I uh, can't see the book behind him and that. Uh, but that's fine. But when the book was, the book, went around the world for sport after that. And it, it, um, it met a series of publishers that hemmed and hawed and really didn't, yeah, wanted, but didn't really want it. And in the end, they, one, one after another, they folded on that. And eventually, it found its way to a small publisher, smallest publisher in Britain and Ireland, and uh, two young women. And uh, they says, we love this book. And they spoke about it for 10 minutes to me. And, and, and I knew in the 10 minutes that, the, that this book had found its proper home with, these, uh, with the Tram Press. And, um, and they seemed to think I was, I was honored. And they were honored to have my book. So it was, a, it was a kind of a marriage made in heaven. And they made promises what they would do with the book if they got it. 
and they got the book and they kept their promises and that. And uh, so the book went on and it was, it, it, it had an adventure that, that I could never have anticipated. And part of this adventure was in March of last year, I get an email from Joseph Lennon with uh, reaching out saying, hi, Mike, read your book and really like your work on that. Would you be interested in, in, in coming to Villanova? And um, it seems like such a long time ago now, but um, it was a wonderful it was a wonderful email to get. Thank you all so much. I'm going to read a piece. Uh, my friends talked about engineering. Uh, my two, uh, our two students there talk so eloquently about the book is about family and it's about engineering. So I'm going to take their prompts and I'm going to read about engineering and about family. Engineers make the world, and that's one of the prompts behind. That's one of the prompts behind Solar Bones. Engineers make the world. Writers write about it. Painters paint it. Um, photographers photograph it, but engineers make it. And I sometimes think we resent them for it. Those of us who work in poetry and prose and painting and that, we, we think ah, it should be us making the world. But it's not. It's engineers. And this is, this is, this is, is Marcus as a child. And he's going back to, he reflects on a moment when I think he may have found his vocation as an engineer. As a nine-year-old kid, he says, I came home from school one day and I walked into the hay shed and I found my father standing over the, over the engine of a tractor completely broken down and laid out on the concrete floor that was dusted with hay seed, piece by piece along its length, cylinder head, pistons, crankshaft. And I stood in the doorway in my school trousers and my jumper and I was terrified at the sight because to one side lay the body of the old Massey Ferguson 35, gutted now of its most essential parts forlorn, its components ordered across the floor in such a way as to make clear not only the sequence of its dismantlement, but also the reverse order in which it would be restored to the full working harmonic of itself. And my father was standing over the whole thing, sighting through a narrow length of fuel line, blowing through it, till he was satisfied that it was clean enough through its length before he laid it on the floor, giving it its proper place in the sequence and explaining to me simply, saying, it was burning oil. And as if this was some sort of viral malfunction that was likely to spread from the machine itself and infect the world's wider mechanism, throwing the universe itself out of kilter to bring it crashing down around the heavens because I knew well that this dismantlement went beyond a fitter's examination of a diesel engine, well beyond stripping out the carb to clear jets. Once again, my father had succumbed to that temptation to make something apart, just to see how it was put together, to know intimately that it was what it was he had put his faith in, as he stood over this altar of disassembly, and there was nothing in his hand but a single open-ended spanner, which he waved over the assemblage as if it were a gesture of forgiveness. And when he told me that this single tool was capable of breaking down this entire tractor, dismantling the whole thing right down to its smallest component, and that it was then sufficient in itself to put the whole thing back together again without any need of any other instrument, my fear only deepened. As I recalled the thoughts that something so, I recoiled at the thought that something so complex and so highly achieved as this tractor engine could prove so vulnerable, so easily collapsed and taken apart by this single tool, and so frightened was I by this fact it would be years afterwards before I could acknowledge the engineering elegance of it all and see it as my father saw it, something graceful and beautifully conceived, not the instrument of chaos it presented itself as to my childish imagination. And this may have been my first moment of anxious worry about the world, the first instance of my mind spiraling away beyond the imminent environs of hearth and home and parish a way out towards the wider world beyond, way beyond. Sitting there looking at those engine parts spread across the hay shed floor, my imagination took fright and it soared to some wider cataclysmic conclusion about how the universe itself was bolted and screwed together. Believing I saw here how heaven and earth could come unhinged 
when some essential Cothran pin was tapped out, which would undo the whole assemblage of stars and galaxies in their wheeling rotations and spin the whole lot plummeting through the void of space towards some final ruin out on the farthest mairn of the universe. And even if my fear at this specific moment did not run to such complete detail, only such cosmic awareness could account for the waves of anxiety that gripped me as I stood over those engine parts on the Haitian floor, soul sick with anxiety, which was not smooth one bit the following day when my father, he drove out the tractor out of the hay shed with a clear spout of smoke blurting from the exhaust and it bounced down the narrow mucky road and out onto the field beyond where it took off into the distance with my father perched high up on the seat getting smaller and smaller in the dim light before man and machine disappeared into a dip in the land as we watched from the gable of the house. There was Annie, my mother, in her house coat, and Ethna clutching her Polaroid camera, which seldom left her hands, which was a present from some visiting Yanks. And my mother said, he's like a child with that thing, you know. And until he was gone, and he was gone from sight as completely as if he had been rubbed from the world. And even if the tractor's successful re restoration did not surprise me, neither did it do anything to rid me of the known conviction that nothing less than the essential balance and smooth running of the universe's mechanism had now been tampered with in some way that might essentially prove fatal to us all. And it's no exaggeration to say that the sight of that engine spread across that hay shed floor would stand to me as a, forever as proof of a world which was a lot less stable and unified than my childish imagination held it to be. A world now a rickety thing of chance components bolted together in the dark. The whole construct humming closer to collapse than I'd ever suspected. A child's fear that sometimes to this day, sometimes even now it takes hold of me and it draws me back to that hay barn just as it did just as it did a few days ago when I was in the village and I was standing outside Kenny's shop and there was a carton of milk in my hand and I had a newspaper and I was standing on the pavement and I watched a huge low loader pass up the main street, a long growling beast of a machine and it was hauling itself along in low gear with the driver high up in the cab over the wheels and taking her carefully through the narrow street making sure that she didn't strip the wing mirrors of the cars parked on either side of her, while the flatbed behind carried something that was dismantled in sections and tied down on both sides with ratchet straps and chains. Something that to first sight appeared to be the luminous bones of some massive extinct creature now disinterred with its ribs gathered into a neat bundle around the thick stump of a massive spinal column which time and the elements had polished to such a cool ceramic gloss that if I were to leave my hands on it, I would be surprised if it felt like anything other than glass. And it was only then, when the whole thing had passed by completely, and I saw the back of the trailer hung with caution tape and hazard decals, that I recognized the load as a wind turbine, and a wind turbine that had been taken and broken down with the veins and the conical tower separated from the nacelle and it was stacked lengthwise along the trailer which, with enough corrosion on the flanges of the base sections to indicate that this turbine had recently been taken apart as a working project and it had been faulty or redundant or obsolete in some way or other, possibly burning oil as my father might have said. And I stood there watching it pass by and thinking that there was something sorrowful and seeing this felled machine being hauled through our little village out here on the western seaboard. Something in me recognizing this as a clear instance of the world forfeiting one of its better ideas, as if something for which there was once great and justified hope had proven to be a failure and the world had given up on some precious dream of himself, one of its better destinies. And I wasn't the only one who stood to stare at its passing because three doors up, on Morrison's corner, an old man stopped in mid-stride and was standing with both hands planted on the boss of a stick and he was looking on at the trailer as it made its careful way through the village while across the street a few others stood and stared on in spite of themselves, generating a stillness which held for a long moment as the low loader rumbled by crossing the square and down the street before it turned out of sight 
beyond the church and out off the Westport Road before people became aware of themselves and they were now looking at each other querulously and laughing as if they'd succumbed to some childish foolishness in the middle of the day. And standing there in the street from them, I wondered where this fallen turbine must be going to. And at the same time thinking it was surely a mistake to think that such things ever go anywhere at all. More accurately, that there is a place to where they, these things could go. A stillness and stasis was the very nature of these constructs. Much like myself at that moment, stuck as I was in a renewal of the old anxiety I had experienced as a nine-year-old in a hay shed, looking up at that diesel engine, the component parts of the world spread out across the floor, except that now, four decades on, when the idea has come a full patient arc through my life, I now understood that if I saw the dismantled tractor as the beginning of the world, the chaotic genesis withdrew it together and assembled it from disparate parts, then this wind turbine was at its end, a destiny it had been forced to give up on, a dream of itself shelved or aborted or miscarried, an old idea which echoed across a radio program I listened to a while back, a radio program in which a panel of experts discussed the future of these wind turbines, weighing their environmental impact against their energy efficiency. And the argument was going back and forth between various critics and advocates, but making little real headway until the topic was turned over to the listeners who, by and large, one after another, echoed what had already been said, except for this one woman, who was hesitant at first, but then her voice cut across the strident tones of the debate. And she phoned in to say that she was living under a hill that was planted with several of these turbines. And whatever about their environmental impact or their worth as a source of energy, she herself had developed something of a spiritual regard for them. And she had only to stand at her back door and look up towards them for a few minutes every day. And she could easily believe that there was something sacred about these turbines. The way they were grouped in silhouette across the horizon, their blades stark against the sky. Were they not vividly evocative of Christ's end on Calvary, crucified without honours, thieves to the left and right of him? And when turning, weren't they almost prayerful, the hum of their dynamo and their ceaseless rhythm so freely generated by the breeze, which was, of course, nothing less than God's breath across the land? And their turning, so evocative of all those Buddhist prayer wheels she had met during her years of travel in India and Tibet. And it was surely the case also that only machines built to so large a scale and of such pristine alloys could bridge or span the distance between heaven and earth with their song on our account. And was she alone in these thoughts, she wondered? Or did anyone else have a similar feeling about these machines, this technology? which of course they didn't, or if they did, they chose that moment to keep it to themselves, so that after a few garbled comments with which the radio host labored hopelessly to place some practical or common sense on her remarks, her contribution to the debate was excused as a quasi-artistic outburst, more in the nature of a mystical reverie than reasoned argument, definitely idiosyncratic in a way which allowed it to be harmlessly set aside or after a few words of praise were levied on its heartfelt eloquence and the obvious depth of the woman's feeling. Something similar to what I felt that day in the middle of Lewisburg, standing on the sidewalk, watching the dismantled turbine being hauled through the main street on its buyer without fanfare or procession. The whole thing so lonely and monumental, it might well have been God himself or some essential aspect of him that was being hauled through our little village on the edge of the world. Death or some massive redundancy having finally caught up with them, so that now he too was being carried off to some final internment or breaker's yard beyond our jurisdiction. Some place where the gods were dismantled and broken down for parts or disposed of completely. Possibly loaded onto a barge and towed offshore by a salvage tug out beyond the continental shelf to be weighed down and sunk in some mid-Atlantic abyssal, down between tectonic plates, all those redundant gods lying crushed and frozen in the blackest depths with no surface marker to show where they lay, out of sight and out of mind, among those things in the world that were 
as my father had said, burn an oil. And that's the, that's uh, Marcus's meditation on, thank you. It's kind of, it's, bit, it's built on two, built on two things that I, I observed. I, I saw a documentary on, on Massey Ferguson uh, the fellow who built Ferguson tractors, and he was, he was nominated, the agricultural industry in the world nominated him as their man of the century, that, uh, of, the, of the 20th century, the maker of the Massey Ferguson tractor. And the Massey Ferguson 35, this tractor, when it came out, it came out with one open-ended spanner. There was a little leather pouch on the back. Of, this is in the 1950s and 60s. It came out with one le there was a leather pouch on the back of the seat, and there was one open-ended spanner on it. And you could break this tractor down and put it back together completely with this single spanner. And um, I remember when I came across that and saw it, it just seemed so frightening and eloquent and so gorgeously conceived that such a, such a complex machine could be put together like that. And, and I used to work in, I used to work in Ballinasloe, uh, which is about 30 miles away from Galway. I used to teach there. And I used to get back to Galway in the depths of the night and that at, at you know, about 2 o'clock in the morning, I, I would return home. And one night at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, I saw a turbine being brought around by the docks. And, it's a, and it was an incredibly big turbine. And it was a huge, big maneuver to bring it around by the narrow, by the narrow gates, by, uh, by the narrow roads and the docks and that. And the, the army was involved and everything. So those two things stuck me, with me when I, was, when, I was, uh, when I was writing this book and that. I'll read one other passage, and I read one other passage, and this passage comes towards the end of the. This passage comes towards the end of the book, and um, I'm always asked, I'm always asked about about, um, or I've, I have been asked a couple of times, what was my what's my favor, my own favorite passage in the book, and I've always answered very promptly. It's the passage I'm going to read, and and. It's about, it's about a man going out starting a car. And the car has been lying redundant. <laughs> the car has been lying um, up for about four weeks, three weeks, four weeks of that. Hasn't been. And it's, 15, it's a 15 year old Toyota. And um, the man gets out, he turns the ignition, and the car comes to life on that. And I've always wondered why it was. I've always wondered why it was, why I, I, I liked it so much in that. I could never account for it, but. But uh, it was always my favorite passage. But I'll read it first for you. And you can, you can, you can hear, possibly hear some of what, what I liked in it and that. And Marcus is just after, Marcus in this passage is just after his wife is on the mend. And he has, she says, she, he, she sends him off to Westport to get a, um, a tonic for her and that. And he grabs the keys and she says, will you take my car? It's been lying there for three weeks. Will you take my car and go out and, uh, and give it a spin and see how it goes? So he says, I grabbed the keys from the bowl on the hall stand, and I pulled the door behind me, and I went out to the car, her old Corolla. And it stood at the gable in shadow and stillness with leaves and twigs caught up in the wipers and a scurf of dust on the windscreen, all the markers of time passing conversion on it and the wind and the rain already going about the patient work of wearing it down. This car which had lain dormant for so long that I stood to look at it for a moment, and I marveled at it before I opened the door and sat into her, and I wondered to myself, will she start? I'll bet the battery is dead in her. And I pushed the seat back to give myself a bit more leg room so that my knees weren't up under the steering wheel, and I adjusted the seat angle so I could as I could never sit comfortably into a car after Marath, whose legs were a lot shorter than mine, who always likes to sit forward in the seat. Whenever I like to lean back, because I like to lean back from the steering wheel, setting myself in, but still wondering, will she start? Is the battery dead? And I turned the key to the ignition, and I brought up all the lights on the dash before a couple of sluggish, labored turns of the engine finally caught, and the causal chain from ignition spark to engine turn was completed smoothly and held as the car surged to life with a healthy growl which carried through the floor panels and up through the seat so that I could feel it vibrate in the bottom of my spine 
as I pumped the accelerator a few times, warming her up, the noise of the engine rising and falling against the gable of the house. And in that roaring moment, all neglect and idleness was set aside as the engine sung out in some mysterious way which thrilled me, but embarrassed me by bringing me to tears, sitting there pumping the accelerator with all the gauges in the dash rising to their proper levels, temp, oil, revs, petrol, of which there was over half a tank, more than enough for the journey ahead. So I sat there with a few moments longer, revving her, feeling extraordinarily happy and impressed that this car had started so easily after lying idle for so long in rain and in cold. This 15-year-old car, which had a full circuit of the clock behind it already, most of it racked up during the kids' teenage years with all its trips to discos and cinemas and summer camps and football matches, all the childhood and adolescent occasions to which, I have to admit, married more often than I ferried the kids and their friends, so much so that she was especially attached to it. It was a sentimental link to that part of our family's life, a repository of all our times together, which would be gone forever if it were scrapped, even if for the time being there was no pressing reason why it should be, though, as year after year this car passed the NCT. It flew through the test with no major engineering flaws that were consigned to a breaker's yard, each year returning a small snag list of faults mirrors and number plates and shocks and lights and tracking and steering, but never any major parts needing replacement, nor mechanical failure after 15 years bouncing over the roads of West Mayo, till it had gradually become clear that this car might well keep going forever, like some pristine machine that had been engineered in some frictionless realm, which knew nothing of deterioration or obsolescence as long as the body hung together, which in fairness might not be too many more years longer, as corrosion had begun to eat along the bottom of the door and the edges of the bonnet, which was to be expected. But so long as the floor panels held out and the road didn't stop showing up under our arses, I didn't have to weld plates onto the chassis. And I sat there a while longer, and I enjoyed the sound of this engine humming away, as if it were a melody from a better world where things ran to their proper purpose, a world where things worked as they should. Before I fired some water up on the windscreen, I was momentarily blinded as the dirt thickened under the wipers driving across the screen in a heavy scarf. For a few moments before it gradually cleared, a broad sweep through which I could see clearly, but which time the sound of the engine had sunk away into my own flesh and bones, cinching with my own shorter rhythms in such a sweet way that when I put her into first to turn out onto the main road and moved her up through the gears, I experienced a shameless, rising joy in my heart as if finally, for the first time in a long while, I was hearing something good something which was not of this world's raucous tumult, but which spoke of that harmonic order which underlay everyone and everything, this gentle vibration running through my spine and up my arms, so that after a few miles I was relaxed in a way I hadn't been in weeks. I was settled back with the radio on, and it was a beautiful day. So that's my favorite passage in the book. <laughs> If I'm, if I'm, you know, if you're allowed to have a favorite passage in your own book, and I was always mystified as to why, I was always mystified as to why I gravitated towards it, and it was, it was, um, it was uh, um, Sarah Cohen who, who said, she says, that's the only happy passage in the whole book, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I, I actually thought it was something to do with a man's kind of satisfaction with an engine starting and something like that, but uh, apparently no. Will I take, we, will I take a question? Yeah, we can take a few questions, if, if people have questions. And I also want to say um, that there are books outside for sale, um, $15 for Solar Bones, and Mike can sign them for you as well. So, um, and one last thank you. Um, so I, I remember when this was reviewed in the New York Times. Yeah. And I read it, and I said, I have to read this book. And then this man here, Jim Murphy, said to me, you know, Mike McCormick might make a good Heimbold chair. <laughs> so um, I'd just also like to thank Jim for that. Uh, a, big, a big thank you to Jim, all right. Has anyone, if anyone has any, any questions or any observations about the book, I'd, I, I, would, I, would, uh, I would welcome it and that. 
Yes, my friend. Surely, coincidentally, yesterday I was talking to a man, a Tyrone man, who was torn over whether he should get rid of his 20 year old truck and, and, and move on to it because, it because it's not going to pass. It's not going to pass the NCT. <laughs> and and, and he, he was going, and only yesterday he was getting a call from his mechanic to say, you know, would you come and look at something else? So just yeah. pure coincidence. And, and, and then later in the day, I was watching on TG Car truckers in the heron about truck drivers and how they have to. You know, go through the, the, these narrow towns and this sort of stuff. Yeah. So it was just an interesting that they were the two sections that you chose to read. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think Massey Ferguson as well, but uh, might have come from that part of the world as well. That 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 he, that he had connections with that part of the world as well. And there, there is brilliant footage. <laughs> there is brilliant footage uh, on YouTube somewhere. I've only seen it recently of a of a turbine being brought through a small Irish village, and, and it comes it comes across around an incredible right angle turn. My heart was in my mouth watching it on YouTube, <laughs> even though even though it successfully did it hundreds and hundreds of times. But it, but it's a great piece of footage. Yeah. I think it was coming from Swinford, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry. I think it was coming from Swinford, if I'm not mistaken. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, it, it could well be. Um, there is, there are, there are, uh, the, the, one of the first wind farms um, in, in Ireland was, was out towards Ballycorrick, which is up towards no in North May, up, up from where my mother's thing comes from. And they were such a striking feature on the Irish landscape. Um, they're not so striking now because we, we're kind of into renewable energy, we're developing a renewable. But these things were there 20 years ago, so they were, they were kind of, they were totemic uh, back in the day in that, and uh, they still are a striking feature in that of, of our landscape. Yeah? Mike, how did you come upon the format of the whole book being found in sentence? Yeah, when, when the, the, I, I was very lucky to spend my, my 20s living with artists. Um, I, I didn't meet a writer until I was until I was about 30 years of age, and I developed. I learned to develop the visual sense. So a lot of my work starts with a visual image, and this started with a visual image of uh, of a man blundering around his kitchen. Very opening chapter starts with a man in the middle of the day blundering around his kitchen, and he seems to be talking to himself and affirming himself and affirming his name and who he is and where he's from, and that gives me. That raised a whole series of questions in my in my in my mind on that, and um, it, it gradually dawned on me that okay, I remembered a piece of folklore from my mother's, my mother's from North Mayo, and I remembered a piece of folklore from there which is uh, has to do with All Souls Day, and it's the dead return, the dead can return to their house on All Souls Day in Mayo, and you leave out, you leave out food and drink for them, but if the dead return, then it becomes a ghost story and. I, I just, it just seemed very obvious to me that a ghost would want, would have nothing to do with a full stop, that a ghost would seek continuance and ongoingness, and that a ghost might falter badly at a full stop. So they would seek this ongoingness. So that became, that defined it, uh, that defined the, the, the style of the book. And for years, in, in uh, over 15 years ago, I used to run an experiment every day on myself as a writer where I would come, into my, come, in, come to my desk and I would write whatever it was that came into my head with only two laws. Whatever it was that I, I wrote had to transition from whatever I was writing uh, the day before. It had to transition smoothly from that. And there could be no full stop because I was interested in where it would take me. And, um, so when I was writing the book, and when I realized that this was a ghost, I remembered, oh, I used to run that experiment. I, I have, I've done something like this before. So those two things came back to me. And aid, I suppose aid came to my aid when I, was, uh, when I started the writing of, of Solo Bones and that. But uh, my, my, my years and my, my years and involvement with, with, uh, with visual artists and being married to Maeve and that has, has had, a, had a huge, valuable influence on my work and that as much as much as my as much as almost as much as my reading in, in many ways and that thank you good question anyone yes
in Kelly's yards in Westport. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a I have a colleague who I have a colleague who who was brought up uh, in, uh, on a farm and he's the same he, he's four or five years younger than me actually and and he remembers the Ferguson 35 he says it's only in the last couple of years that we got rid of it and that and and it was kind of traumatic to to be passing away from it but yeah tractors feature in this tractors there's another tractor in the middle of this book on that and 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 it's and it, the, the book starts with the book starts with with the, with the I was brought up on a farm and spent time on, I was one of those children who was fostered out to their grandparents as a child I spent it's not it's not unusual in my generation I was fostered out to my grandparents in North Mayo uh, for two or three years and um, and it, it was a hugely valuable and happy experience I was I was I was perfectly content. I, I understood my, my, my parents were in London, but I understood myself to be in my family and I understood myself to be safe and everything and I was, and I, and I loved it. And they had a farm there that was, a, they had a farm that was, that was powered by horse and cart and by, and that used machinery and technology which hadn't evolved or which had reached the peak of its evolution in, in the medieval times. Plows and harrows and scufflers go back that age. And my uncle at that time, my uncle at the time, he was in his early 20s at the time, he used to go out into the fields with plows and harrows and scufflers and that kind of thing. And in that man's lifetime, 40 years later, that same man who worked with that medieval technology bought a tractor that had GPS in it. That was, and can, can you imagine that, that psychic imaginative leap within, within the lifetime of, of, of one man? Um, and I, I find that I find that incredible. I find that absolutely extraordinary. So, so the the, um, the just went from a medieval farm went to something space age in, in in a lifetime, and that it was it was an incredible leap. Yeah. So tractors form a big part of the <laughs> the consideration of the book, and that. Is there a student question? Question by student. Don't be shy. <laughs> Hi, Claire. I guess I'm Claire. Class as well, but <laughs> Good to see you, Claire. How are you? Good to see you. How, could, how do you focus on one object and come up with all of these excursions off of it? Like, it seems like you keep on coming up with new things just from a normal, ordinary object. Yeah, I, I think, I think that, that's a, one of the things I've learned to do is to stand and look at things. And that's one of the things I've learned to do is to stand and look at things. And that, that's be, uh, having a being exposed to to visual artists who have developed a long gaze, a long gaze and an ability to meditate on things. Um, when I when I when I met Maeve first, uh, we used to go to galleries and that, and together, and we used to come out afterwards and kind of compare notes. And Maeve would ask me, "Well, what did you see in there?" And I would start blathering about, tw try to blather about 20 different, 30 different things that I saw in the gallery. And I would say, well, what did you see? And she'd say, well, I saw two things in it. And so they, they had this a, a gradual exposure, long exposure to, to, uh, to and, and the gaining by default of a, of a sort of a, 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 an eye and, and a long gaze that's been Really, the gift of people uh, who worked in visual arts has, has contributed to, to that, I think. But it's a, it's a good question because it's, uh, it's something I really value. And, and it's, um, I'm always trying to, and I, uh, something I don't think I've mentioned in class, but I'm always exhorting my students to A, go to galleries, and B, if you can ever get to work with an artist, take the opportunity to do it because it's, it'll, it, they, they, they think and work very differently. And also, the way they think and work differently opens up doors in your head that you didn't know there were such doors there in your head and that. And it's a, it's a thrilling experience. Good to see you, Claire. Thank you. One last question. Um, and I, uh, I just oh, hi. Hello. How are you? Good. I just finished teaching to the lighthouse. Hi, Megan. How are you? Good. Yeah. You kind of gave me a question that I wanted to ask because to the lighthouse is about paintings. So yeah. Like 
what, in, what is it that the written word is particularly yeah. directed towards that may be sculpture or painting? I, 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 I don't, I don't know. I would like to think that there. I would. I'd certainly like to think that there is things that we can do that, that, um, that visual arts can do and that cinema can do. That there is an interiority and a contemplation and a re an interior resonance, that 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 can only be achieved and that can only be experienced by the rhythms, um, and the the depth and the time needed to experience poetry and the novel and that. I think um, one, of our, one of your great critics, uh, he wrote the Gutenberg Elegies. What's his name again? Sven Burkertz. And Sven Burkertz has lamented. He, he's talked about what he, rather old fashionedly, so the death of interiority and that. And, uh, and he's really brilliant on that, on the necessity and the experience of reading. And, and I think that there is something about the focus and the commitment and the length of time. Do you know, you know, you know who my hero is, Megan? And my heroes are, is, are readers, people who will willingly, through no compulsion on my part, but willingly set aside three or four hours of their life in a world that offers much more immediate and sudden gratification, will set themselves aside three and four hours to sit and to commune with my book in the hope that those words that I sequence one after another, that it brings them somewhere that cannot be done otherwise, that cannot be achieved otherwise. I'm not, I hope I'm right on that. And I, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm getting close to there's something, something close to prayer, I think, in, in, in what we do with words. I think, I think, I think poetry, Definitely, and prose that they're in prayer that they're cut from the same cloth, and they and that all three of them in their separate ways have this hopeless task of trying to say the unsayable, and that it can only be done in words. I think I, I've I've um, I've long experienced it in, in painting, and 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 I and actually it's much more. That unsayability is much more vivid in painting. Uh, you, the mystery of what they do is much more visible and much more um, readily mystifying than that. But um, I would like to think that as a fiction writer, and, you know, and fiction, it, fiction is lumpy and bumpy and that. And, it, and it's, fiction is lumpy and bumpy and it's, it's not as stringent. It doesn't call for the same accuracies that say, the novel doesn't call for the same accuracies that the short story does. The short story doesn't call for the same accuracies and focus that poetry does. But there's something about the novel. There's a generosity of, maybe this is what I'm trying to, to say. There's a generosity of spirit in the novel that's exclusive to the novel. It's, the novel is blathery and it's circuitous and it's digressive. And it's like life in that way. And that's why we forgive the novel these things, because it, the novel makes this attempt to embrace and to gather in all the, and, and this is what I was trying to do in, in, in some ways in Solar Bones. I was, trying to, I was trying to write a book that would gather in all the rhythms and circumstances of life. And there's two ways of doing this. You can write a big, huge 600-page novel to do that, like a 19th century writer. And I can't do that because I don't have that rhythms, those rhythms or those extensions and that. But I had this canny idea. If I can't write a long book, maybe I'll write a long sentence and see how, <laughs> see how, see how I can get on with that. So I think, it's, I think, I think generosity, is, is, generosity is, is what brings, it, brings us to fiction. Um, that it has this, and, and, and we forgive fiction. It's, it, it's unruliness, it's bagginess, because we know that somehow it's been true to life in many, in many ways when it's doing all of those things. And, and of course, those things are the very things that militate against it, sometimes being an art form and that, you know, sometimes make it messy and slobbery and throw it out of complete alignment and that. Uh, but we, there are novels, and you don't say it about many, you don't say it about many art forms. 
but you say, um, that's all over the place, but it's brilliant. Uh, or it's a complete mess, but you still go with it. You'd never say that about a poem. You'd never forgive a poem that, but you can forgive the novel that. You can forgive the novel messiness and slobberiness and that. There's, I don't know, there's something more different to be won, I think, in the novel. So maybe to, to go back and answer your question, maybe there's a generosity in the novel that's exclusive to the novel and that that's what we're, that's what maybe I, what I was looking at and maybe what I was looking for.